I want to welcome you to our, we're almost done with our series called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Temple. And this series is a series on the Psalms of Ascent, which start in Psalm 120 and go to Psalm 134. Um, the Psalms are the Hebrews worship book. There are 50 Psalms in it. And what's unique about these few Psalms, these 15 Psalms, is they're probably the only section in the Psalms where there's a narrative, where they're all tied together in some way. And so these these psalms are songs that were sung as the Hebrew people would head up into the hills and to Jerusalem, to the holy city, for usually three festivals. But to be honest with you, probably they went up at least once a year, and that was for Passover. And the reason that they're called Psalms of Ascent is that you have to go up into the hills to get to Jerusalem. And they kind of also start out with people far away from God. The singing in Psalm 120 is about being so far from God that you're just kind of confused in the lies that you're believing and hearing and that peace and truth are not part of who you are and you feel separated. And so the journey kind of moves forward in these Psalms to give you courage, to reconcile you with God, and to kind of bring you into the community of God. And so we're going to be covering Psalm 133, And basically, once you get to Psalm 130 or 131, the Hebrew people have arrived or are very close to Jerusalem and to the temple and to the holy city. And so there's this sense of uh, a picture that's being drawn of what it's like to be in the presence of God. Now, though we're ending in the the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Temple um, next week, we just started Advent. Okay, now, Advent means coming or arrival, um, and it is the four weeks before Christmas. And what you do in Advent is the, the whole point within the church calendar is for us as a community to begin the process of reorienting ourselves and focusing on the birth of Jesus. And so when we celebrate Advent as a community, what we're saying is there's a kind of a uh, a challenge or a, a kind of a push as a community to say, you know what, together we're going to try to encourage one another not to be caught up in the messages of the world and the messages of the things that are kind of pushing in on us during Christmas, during the December season, during this holiday season. And we're going to really focus on Jesus, on his birth, on preparing ourselves to celebrate that, but also as followers of Jesus to begin to contemplate and and grab hold of our hope that Jesus is coming to make all things new. And so last week we talked a little bit about the idea of hope, and that is the first week of Advent. And we have four purple candles that kind of represent different ways of preparing ourselves, or different ways of kind of reorienting ourselves towards um, Christmas and towards Jesus' birth. So the first candle is uh, hope. If we can light our flame here. And then this week is for preparedness. And so I'll integrate some of that, hopefully, into our message out of Psalm 133 tonight. Um, But I would like to start tonight in Ephesians chapter 3. So if you have a Bible, you can turn there, um, or you can just write it down and I'll read it to you, and you can look at it later. But Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10 and following is where I'm going to start out tonight. I kind of want to just draw a picture of some things for you before we head into the psalm to kind of give you a sense of of, um, maybe a, a, a richness behind the psalm itself. So, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. The writer Paul says this, and he's speaking of God. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord. In him, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings, for you, which are your glory. Paul offers us a really interesting picture about the church. And that is that when we gather 
when the community of God gets together, the manifold wisdom of God is revealed. And it's not just that when we get together, the manifold wisdom of God is revealed to our neighbors or to our friends, but actually the manifold wisdom of God is revealed to the heavenly realms, to the spiritual world. So if you just take a moment and think about this, this, the idea that anybody, any community that gathers around Jesus and comes together to worship Him is a manifestation of the wisdom of God. And I've talked about this passage before, and one of the things I suggested that you think about it is like the AT&T map, right? All of the cell phone maps are always trying to say, oh, look at how great our coverage is, right? And they pan off the United States, and there are all these little points of light, and there are clusters of light, and, and then you see some places in Montana where there's no light, right? I mean, nobody has a cell phone in Montana. Um, anyway, that's kind of what Paul is saying in the spiritual world. As the spiritual world pans out over the world, like, and churches are meeting and communities are gathering, they're an announcement about God's wisdom. And that is that broken image bearers like you and me, people who've run away from God, can actually run unabated into the presence of God and worship Him without being destroyed. What, what, what's so incredible here is that you and I are right now, because of what Christ did, sitting in the presence of the Father, which is mind-blowing to the spiritual world. And we're making an announcement. So part of the excitement of going to church is that you are not just making an announcement to the neighbors that, hey, some people go to church there. You're not making an announcement to your friends, oh, I go to church, I'm a follower of Jesus. But what you're doing is in some ways kind of a little Star wars S, or vice versa. Star Wars is kind of like this. We understand light and darkness. We understand that there's some greater thing. And so when you come and worship God together in community, you are making a huge statement to the spiritual world. You're doing something big by simply coming. Now, I I want you to to hold that in mind because it's not just that you and I get this opportunity to demonstrate the manifold wisdom of God to the spiritual world, but there's something that's given to us that's really special. And so I want to quickly turn to 1 Peter. And and if you've been at the village at all, then you have heard a lot of these ideas. But I want to make it very clear that when you hear a pastor repeat himself, it's a good thing, not a bad thing. Because you don't remember anything, right? Right? I need to repeat it to you. Because you need to hear it at least three times to just start kind of processing it into your own life. Probably need to hear it a couple hundred times to really make it sink. So I want you to hear this. When we gather, we're a demonstration to the spiritual world of God's wisdom. But then there's a role that we've been given that's that's important. So in 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter tells us who we are. He says this, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness and into His wonderful light. So it's not just that you and I come together and there's this spiritual announcement being made. You and I have these identities of being royal priests, Like, we're part of a kingly thing, and we're all priests. So, if you could imagine, like, you know, we're all very laid back. We all have t-shirts on. We have, like, you know, we're very part of our culture. And so we don't kind of understand that priestly sense of things. Like, we can't, like, nobody in the world looks at us and they go, oh, you know, Scott over here, definitely a priest, right? He, he's got cowboy boots on and jeans. Like, that's that's not the normal priest garb, right? Like, that's not what we think in our head as priests. But if you could imagine that as you come to pilgrim groups and gather with other Christians, you come to the village, that if you were preparing and you were putting on your brown robe and you were putting on your cowl and you you were you were walking to church, like, you would have a sense of, oh, I'm a priest. I have a position. I don't think most of us think that way. We don't come to church thinking, I am a king. I am a royal priest. 
I'm going to make an announcement to the dark world about who God is Sunday night. Not only that, my job, the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to tell my story about how I came out of darkness to light. Like that the whole role of this kingly priest that you are is to say, I once was in darkness and now I'm in light. And that's mind-blowing. That's the manifold wisdom of God that you can come and sit and tell that story and have a title in God's kingdom. Now, I don't know about you, but those are that's really cool, Eric. But it, it is hard to do those things. And it's hard to think that way. And so, I want to um, quickly turn to to John before we get back to Psalm 33, or 133. And read out of John 14. I'm going to start in verse 15 and then I'll jump to verse 25. But these, this is Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit. And He says in verse 15, If you love Me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and He will give you a counselor to be with you forever. Okay? So, It's not just that we gather, that we're royal priests, that we're making this awesome announcement, but the God of the universe, if you're a follower of Jesus, has bestowed with you, he's given to you a counselor. And in verse 25, he explains who this is a little bit more. He says, all this I have spoken while still with you, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid. So there's this this thing that when we come together and as we're gathering, the Spirit of God is here with us when we're alone, but with us when we're together. And He's our counselor. But not only that, the important thing is He continues to remind us of the teachings of Jesus. He's constantly present with us and He gives us peace. Not peace like the world, right? Not an absence of conflict. But what we would say in the Hebrew is shalom, a top-to-bottom contentedness. Okay? So this top-to-bottom contentedness, you could imagine as being anointed. Okay? So in the New Testament, when we think about the Holy Spirit, it is equivalent to the idea of being anointed by oil in the Old Testament. Okay? I want you to hold that in your mind. So, as priests, our anointing, the oil that goes on us, is the Spirit of God. And we talked about this in Acts, that the Spirit of God comes on us to do things that we just can't do, and the Holy Spirit is in us all the time, reminding us of the teachings of Jesus and transforming us. Right? And that is our, what we would call, an anointing. Right? We've been anointed by the Spirit of God. I want you to have that all in your mind as we think about Psalm 133. And that's where we're going to spend the rest of the time. So you can turn there. Well, we will jump into Exodus in a minute, but Psalm 133. Psalm 133 starts out like this. How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. Now, some translations say, behold. I like the net Bible. It says, look. NIV doesn't even say any of this. But there's a sense in the text that the pilgrims have arrived and in Jerusalem. And the song is kind of telling them, slow down. Stop, right? Think about what's happening in this moment. So usually there's a look here or a behold. Now, I live with a 16-year-old girl named um, Anna. And every single time that Anna comes in the door, she yells, I'm home, really loud. She could go on out on a walk. She's coming home from school every single time. What she's saying, like any good 16-year-old girl would be saying, is, hey, look at me, I'm important. You all need to pay attention to me, right? I'm here, hello, right? Well, that's kind of the idea of how this 
particular psalm begins, actually, is, is a stop and look at something that's happening. Now, the first phrase here says, how good and pleasant it is. Now, there's no need to kind of, for me to explain good and pleasant. All of you know good and pleasant, right? You understand what good and pleasant means. Like you understand the difference between good and pleasant. So what he's saying is how good and pleasant. You all get that. It is when brothers live together. And that's the important part because this word brothers doesn't mean general humanity. It means Israel. So he's saying, look everybody, look how good and pleasant it is when Israel, when all of us who've been headed up the mountain to Jerusalem, when we're dwelling together. But this dwelling idea, this living together, is not me living next door to somebody and I make sure that my tree doesn't grow over their wall and I'll collect their mail when they go on vacation. That's that's not what this is talking about. This is not just kind of a, we are next to each other. This is God's people living, in, and there's kind of a sense here of like Sabbath, living in something purposeful, Right? How good it is for God's people to live together doing something with purpose. Okay? And then he says, in unity. And this word unity is a really interesting word because in this first line, the psalmist is kind of communicating that this is kind of ironic. That this is ridiculous. Like, so what he's saying is, look, we've all come up the mountain, there's unity, like we're all together and we're doing the same thing, and there's unity, and that's kind of ridiculous. Because this word here, unity, is often used, like now in modern times they use it for, uh, when a rabbi is actually trying to describe Judaism and democracy. Like he uses this word because it's kind of ridiculous, because Judaism and democracy can't be unified. Like they don't work together. And so they use it kind of to say when they, it's sort of a, like that's impossible, but it's happening anyway. And so there's a modifier on this word. And so some, this word is used like for Abraham and Isaac being equal of heart. Um, sometimes it's used so that you're, they're strong hearted. But what the writer is trying to communicate when he's talking to everybody is he's saying, there's something else here. It's not the unity that's happening as we are all together and it's good and pleasant, is not happening because we're all good and pleasant. Like something else is going on here. Now, Psalm 133 is a really popular psalm because when you talk about community in the church, you use this psalm. In fact, last year, when we did a series on community, Ron preached on Psalm 133. Um, And when I read this, I think this is not how my experience of community is. Um, and Ron said something really interesting about this particular part of the passage that I, I want to give to you because it's kind of transformed the way I think about things. Um, he talked about how grace is not given to things that are beautiful. He said grace is given to things that are ugly. Right? Ugly things need grace. Pretty things have grace. Right? And then he proceeded to say, and you are all ugly and in need of grace. Because he was talking about the experience of church and the experience of the community of God. And when we come into the community of God, what we find is not good and pleasant, right? You know, you hear, if you've listened to enough preachers like I have, you hear this dumb joke about how, well, somebody says the church is full of hypocrites and then the pastor says, well, come join us because you're one too, right? Like, yeah, that's, that's a nice truth. We are all part of, are we all hypocrites? But the reality is it's, it's messy. So Ron went on to say something that really helped me understand what's happening here. He said it's not just that the church is in need of grace because it's full of ugly people, like we're all broken and, and messed up. It's, when you go to church, it's like walking past caution tape into a grisly murder scene. Okay? That when you come to a community who's following Jesus, the reality is, is that we're all messed up. That when you come through the doors, if you expect perfection, 
And if you expect people to all be nice, and if you expect there to be beauty, you're going to be sadly disappointed. Because Jesus came not for the people who had it together, but the people who don't have it together. Right? He came for the murder scene. And that's us. This grisly murder scene. And yet, the writer of Psalm 133, I think, has this in the back of his mind. We've been traveling a long time up to Jerusalem. We all know each other. We've all had to kind of go camping together. We, we get it. And yet, isn't it amazing that in the midst of all of our brokenness, it's good and pleasant to be together in unity. And he's saying there's something that's happening here that's beyond us. And like a good Hebrew poet, he's going to give us two examples of what's happening to try to help us. He's going to paint a picture. So in verse 2 he says, It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robe. So, What he's saying is that this experience smells like something. It smells like something. I want to show you what it smells like, okay? So you can kind of, I wish I could mix this up, but I can't. So I'm going to read to you Exodus 31, starting in verse 22, and then explain to you these smells. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, and so this is some instructions given to Moses on how to establish worship in Israel. Take the following fine spices, 500 shekels of liquid myrrh, half as much, that is 250 shekels, of fragrant cinnamon, 250 shekels of fragrant cane, 500 shekels of cassia, all according to the sanctuary shekel, and a hen of olive oil. Make these into a sacred anointing oil, a fragrant blend, the work of a perfumer. It will be the sacred anointing oil. Then use it to anoint the tent of meeting, the ark of the testimony, the table and all the articles, the lampstands and the accessories, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering, and all its utensils, and the basin with the stand. You shall consecrate them so that they will be most holy, and whatever touches them will be holy. Anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them so they may serve me as priests. Say to the Israelites, this is to be my sacred anointing oil for the generations to come. Do not pour it on men's bodies and do not make any oil with the same formula. It is a sacred it is sacred and you are to consider it sacred. Whoever makes perfume like it and whoever puts it on anyone other than a priest must be cut off from his people. Okay. This is pretty smelly. So now you got to understand something. When you're an Israelite and you go to the tent of meeting, or you go to the temple, it smells. This perfume is on everything. And it's on the priests. Okay? So, a couple of years ago, maybe two years ago, one year ago, my wife, who rides the bus, needed a jacket. And she wanted a particular kind of jacket, a warm jacket. Because she's going to stand out there at 6.30 in the morning to catch the bus. So we went... You know, jacket shopping. I don't know why we did this, but we started at the mall. She walked by, and I hate to admit this, Amber Combi and Fitch. And in the window is a jacket. Now, we don't want to go in Amber Combi and Fitch for many reasons. Um, <laughs> so we walk by Amber Combi and Fitch, and we search all over. Well, it turns out that the jacket at Amber Combi and Fitch is the jacket we must buy. So, of First, we go and rob a few banks. So I don't know if you remember a few banks were robbed a few years ago. That was us to afford the Amber Combrey and Fitch jacket. Um, don't tell anybody. So we go in there. We buy the jacket. Now, I don't know if you know this, but they spray perfume on everything in Amber Combrey and Fitch. They spray it on the clothes you buy, on the jackets. And, you know, you think maybe somebody's going to pop out and spray it on you. Um, so you kind of have to close your eyes while you go in there. And smell. Um, anyway, so she buys the jacket. She goes home. And Vivi, where are you, Vivi? Are you here? I thought Vivi, who's Jesse's uh, girlfriend, um, sees 
Sue in her jacket, and she gives Sue a hug because, you know, she's Hispanic. She hugs everybody. Um, and then she says, oh, you smell like popularity, right? <laughs> because popularity, so a particular social standing, has a smell. Got it? What this poet is saying is the thing that's happening in community is like coming into the temple and smelling the presence of God. But not just that. It's like the priest himself being anointed. There's something special here and it has this joy like of being connected in the, in the, it smells good. And so when, the reason that we have Aaron in this poem here is because Aaron is the one who's anointed to offer or mediate between God and the people. And so what they're saying, what the, the poet is saying here is that this unity that we've experienced has this spiritual component to it. It has a component that's connected to relationship with God. That God is the one creating this unity. Okay? So go back to the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit is our anointing, then as you walk into community together, and the, and the Spirit of God in me and the Spirit of God in you comes together, there's a spiritual, I hate to say it this way, there's a spiritual smell that comes out of this. I think there's a beauty to this. There's a power to this. Like So there's something that's, that's deeper, right? That's, that's pulling us together. And so that's the connection there. So this unity that we experience it's something precious. It's something that we can taste. It's something that, that is beyond us. It's like being in the presence of God. It's like actually being in the temple itself. Then he goes on and he talks about, he said, it, it is as if the dew of Mount Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows His blessing, even life, forevermore. Now, Mount Hermon is, is to the north. I think it's between Syria and Lebanon. But, you know, the Mediterranean Sea is up above it. And it's, I think, as big as the Catalinas and 2,000 feet taller. But there's two things that happen there. Is One is that it's got snow on it all the time. And the water comes off the mountain. And it basically keeps Israel and the surrounding areas you know, so they can water their crops and drink, and it keeps a very dry area watered. Okay? So he's saying, first, it's like the smell of being in the temple, this unity we're experiencing. Second, it's like life itself. So, I think this is really important. He's saying, everybody look, stop for a moment. It is good and pleasant when God's people have a focus it's so good when God's people have a focus and they're unified that it's like the Spirit Himself is doing something. And it, it, it's as if you can smell it. But not only if it's, you can smell it, it's as if the Spirit of God has poured life into us. So, when you and I, given to a purpose, coming into the kingdom of God, coming to church on Sunday, coming in and gathering and proclaiming to the spiritual world who Jesus is through our stories, through sitting in front of God, we have to stop and say, this right now, what we're doing is really sweet and really powerful and really good. And so, you could read it like this. How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity, brothers and sisters, for their the Lord bestows His blessing, even life, forevermore. The idea simply is this. That when you and I come together and we make an announcement about who God is together, it's connected to salvation. It's connected to life. When you come through the doors, what you're tasting here with everybody, living together 
worshiping God, is you're tasting a little bit of what it's going to look like in the future. You're making an announcement about what it's going to look like in the future. You're that, that ridiculousness, when we're in heaven, we're going to look around at each other and we're going to say, it's good and pleasant to be here. And that's kind of ridiculous. Like it doesn't make sense that all of us could sit here. It's a little, something bigger than us is going on. So when I read Psalm 133, and I think about Advent, I don't know how many of you have been reading the emails, but some of you are new, and we talk about fallow month. December for our church for a long time is when we try to stop everything except Sunday nights. We try to encourage people to hang out in families, to invite friends over to just take a deep breath, to stop and look around and say, oh my gosh, this is crazy. Like The fact that I get to live with people who know Jesus and to worship with people, it's like it's like popularity. It's like Abercrombie and Fitch without all the Abercrombie and Fitch, right? It's, it's got this deep, meaningful smell to it that gets awakens our senses. So tonight I want to close with, with something that um, just struck me. Last night in our, our monastic community, we were acting out the um, nativity scene. So I don't know... <laughs> if you've seen Drunk History, ever. Um, but in Drunk History, they get some guy drunk, who's, you know, a second-tier celebrity, who's then studied some historical event, and then they get him really drunk, and he tells the historical event, and some other actors all act out the historical event, only they mouth the, uh, they kind of lip-sync everything that the drunk person is saying. And so it's ridiculous and it's funny and it's a little disturbing. So I got it. I was inspired. So I thought, well, we're going to read the uh, nativity scene and all of the things that are around it. And our whole monastic community is going to act it out. And they really got into it. And it was really funny. It was much more funny than drunk history because none of us were drunk. Um, I don't know why I went on that long thing to tell you that. But as we were, as we were going through that, um, Something struck me just out of the the announcement um, from the angels to the shepherds. And so I wanted to read that to you out of Luke chapter 2. So some shepherds are hanging out and this is what happens to them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. And, and that, that last phrase, the announcement of, of glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When I read Psalm 133, when I think about the birth of Jesus, when I think about preparing for the birth of Jesus, the thing that keeps striking me is, here are these people on this pilgrimage, and all of a sudden they stop and look around, and they're like, wow, we've stepped into peace. We've stepped into something that's bigger than ourselves. So as you think about the birth of Jesus, Realize that when you begin to reflect on what Christ has done for you, when you embrace that, 
you are embracing peace. Peace that's been given to you. And that's huge. That's something that you need to think of Anna saying, hey, I'm here. Stop. Look around. Take a deep breath. It's pretty amazing that the God of the universe became a little baby. And out of that, you and I here can be unified. This smells good. That there's a life in it forevermore. Let's pray. Father, thank you um, for this community. And I, I just want to stop and just lift up all the people who are sick. I want to lift the people who've been injured. I want to lift up uh, Mike's grandma um, and all the others who just uh, aren't feeling well. Um, I know a lot of this goes around in December, and so I just ask that you would lay your healing hand on on our community and in the places where it needs to be lifted up, that you would lift um, us up. And I ask tonight too, Lord, that as we celebrate your birth, that you would help us to just take a deep breath, to look around, to be amazed at what you've done and what you're doing and what you've invited us into. And I ask that in your name. Amen. So, we're going to, Andrew's going to come up and sing a little with us. Um, and while he's doing that, I'm just going to pass the offering plate around here. If you're visiting with us, you don't need to give anything. Um, it's the way we support the community. If the last person would just put it underneath the uh, chair, that'd be awesome. Um, while Andrew and Susan sing and play the cello, um, I would ask that you not come up for communion, but I'm going to offer that now. Um, and then after they're done and we're singing together, you can come up for communion. But on the night that Christ was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said to his disciples, this is my body broken for you. And at the end of that Passover meal, he took the last cup of wine um, and he held it up and he said, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. It is the new covenant. And so, if you can say that you stand with Jesus' broken body and his blood poured out for you, after the music is, after they're done singing, um, come on up, take some bread, dip it in the juice, and remember what, what Christ has done for you. You want to turn it off? I got the power light on. There can you go. guys hear me? Yeah, nice. I just, I wasn't close enough. Um, all right, so before before we sing, I, I want to say a few words about a, a specific word in this psalm. Uh, it's the the word for pleasant. Um, so, you know, as Eric was reading, the song goes, Behold how good and how pleasant it is when brethren dwell in unity. And that word for pleasant is naim. And you guys might recognize a character from the Bible with whose name is similar to that, Naomi. Um, so you guys know the story of Naomi? Uh Naomi was somebody who lived in Bethlehem. She was married, and during a famine, uh, her family left Bethlehem, and they went to a foreign land. Uh, they went out to Moab because there was food in Moab, and she wasn't finding food in Bethlehem. Um, and so she's living with her husband and her two sons in Moab. Um, and while she's in this foreign country, she just experiences a lot of hardship. Her husband dies. Uh, both of her sons die. And so there she's out on her own, uh, much like our uh, pilgrim begins, like out in Meshech and Kedar, like we've talked about, like living in exile, living estranged from the people of God. So she left her family and her people during a difficult time, and she's been out on her own, and she's experienced a lot of suffering. And she finally comes to the end of that time, and she kind of limps her way back home with her daughter-in-law, Ruth. Uh, and when she arrives back in town, she says to the people who see her, she's like, they say, well, Naomi's back, and everybody's really interested. She's been gone for a long time. And she says, don't, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara. She's basically saying, don't call me pleasant. Call me Mara, which means bitter, because God has dealt bitterly with me. Um, so she's, she's basically thinking her story's over. And so she and Ruth settle on the outside of Bethlehem, and they plan on kind of eking out a living off the scraps of the field. And they, um, in Jewish culture, they would leave the fields the edges of the fields uh, uncultivated so that uh, the poor people could glean there and, and, make, and at least have food to eat. Um, so she's planning on eking out a living on the outside of town. 
and basically planting like her stories over, her lines over, no more sons. And it's really beautiful what God does for her. He kind of surprises her all along the way. And instead of, by the end of the story, instead of just making, eking out a living on the edge of town, her daughter-in-law Ruth has connected with the the greatest, a, a righteous man named Boaz, the greatest landowner in town. And uh, instead of having scraps, she ends up getting the best of the fields of Boaz. Um, and instead of her line being over, uh, she ends the story with a son through Ruth. And the women around her are all saying, like, blessed are you, uh, Naomi. God has been good to you. And he's given may this son be a refresher and a restorer of life for you. Uh, so it's a, it's a, for me, it's, it's a beautiful picture of what when we see, I guess we, we see a mess, what God sees where when we see a mess, like we come and we see kind of everybody getting together. Church can be messy, but God sees something that he delights in. So Naomi comes back and says, call me bitter. But God says, no, I won't call you bitter. I named you Naomi because I delight in you. And Naomi, it means my delight. Um, and then it also another kind of a beautiful thing is all that God does in Naomi's line. So Naomi didn't just have a son through Ruth. Um, that son had a son who had a son named David, King David, who wrote most of the Psalms that we're singing. Um, and David had a son who had a son who had a son, the line of David, who was uh, through whom came King Jesus. So David had a son who had a son who had a daughter named Mary who gave birth to the Son of God. And so from Naomi, who thought her story was over, who thought her life was over, who was basically saying, call me bitter, that's it. God's done with me. He's written me out of the story. God actually says, no, I won't call you bitter. You are my delight. And look at what I'm going to do from your mess. I'm not only going to give you a son, but I'm going to give the world my son uh, who will save you from your sins. And it's um, because God is so big, the story goes on. And we know that after seven weeks after Jesus died, um, when the disciples are gathered together in the upper room, uh, they're gathered together in one accord. God kind of pours out his spirit on Pentecost. Um, and a, a small, a little tidbit about Pentecost, the Jewish holiday of Shavuot, that is when Jews traditionally read the book of Ruth. So uh, during Jewish holidays, there are different books that are read traditionally associated with each holiday. So every year at Shavuot, Jews, and to this day they still do it, they read the book of Ruth. So it's a fascinating thing to me that uh, Naomi, who thought her story was over, I mean, a thousand years later, all of the disciples are gathered together in one accord, and they're, I don't know, Jews around Jerusalem would have been reading the book of Ruth, and it's a pilgrim feast, and we've been talking about songs of ascent, the pilgrim feast, and we know that during Pentecost, there were people from all over the world, Jews from every nation under heaven, it says, and they're gathered together, reading Naomi's story, uh, the book of Ruth, um, reading the Psalms of Ascent, and then God pours out his spirit on everyone who's gathered together. And that picture of the disciples gathered together in one accord on Pentecost is probably to me one of the greatest pictures of Psalms 133 because it says over and over again that they were gathered together in one accord, in one place. They were all together. And like Eric was walking us through, the images in, in Psalms 133, uh, all of the images are of just blessing coming down from heaven, whether it's the oil being poured out on the head of Aaron running down his beard to the edges of his clothes, or whether it's the dew from Mount Hermon coming down from the tallest mountain in northern Israel all the way to the mountains of Zion. And in in Acts, you know, we have God uh, pouring out his spirit on the disciples who are gathered there and the tongues of fire that are on their heads and how that empowers them. And then they turn around and they preach to all of Jerusalem and 3,000 people get saved. Um, and all, all of this from a woman who thought her story was over. Um, she said, call me bitter. And God said, no, you're my delight. Um, so I think that's something I, 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 I see it in myself and I, I see it around here sometimes. We, uh, we've experienced a lot of pain and we do come back to the people of God, but sometimes we're content to sit on the fringes of the spiritual life or on the kind of the edge of the community of God and just say, I'm back, but I'm back, but you know, I'm my life. It's I'm sad, and my life will be sad. There's nothing but bitterness ahead for me, and I think in that God loves to surprise us. And He says, "No, it's not a life of bitterness ahead for you, but you're my delight." And so, um, there's one more point here in uh, Psalms 27. Uh, this this word comes up again. Uh, this word, Naim, pleasant. Uh, when David says, "One thing I've desired." That will I seek, 
that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple, to seek him in his temple. And that psalm is the, that's the pilgrim's heart. And that word to behold the beauty of the Lord, that word for beauty is noam, which is related to Naim or Naomi, pleasant. To behold the pleasantness of the Lord. And so there's this beautiful picture of like the way that God delights in us. We're his delight. And he calls us to just to delight in him, to come together. And it's the one thing that brings us all together, unites us all, is that we can come together because of what Jesus has done, come boldly into his presence and delight in him and look into his eyes and see the tender love that he has for us. And right there, as I've said many times, so much healing happens when we see just how much God loves us. So we're going to sing this song together. We're going to go through it once slowly um, so that we can all sing it and then we'll sing it again.